The Great Second Advent Movement by J. N. Lothborough, Chapter 5, The Second Advent Message. Quote, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it, margin, he, is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass, till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Close quote, Matthew 24, verses 32 to 35. In this scripture, our attention is directed to the time when it is possible to learn that the coming of Christ is at the doors, with the same assurance that we know that summer is near when we see the first tender young leaves putting forth. It may also be known that we have come to the generation which shall not pass off the stage of action until Christ himself shall come. When the time comes to learn the parable, it is emphatically true that it is the Lord's time to raise up teachers to teach the parable. The inquiry of the apostle on another occasion is equally applicable here. Quote, how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Close quote. Romans 10 verses 14 and 15. The time for the signs. In the previous chapter, we saw how knowledge was obtained concerning the termination of the 2300-day period and that it extended to the hour of his judgment. In the parable here introduced, we are brought to the Lord's time for this parable and the judgment message to be proclaimed to the world. After speaking of the great tribulation which was to come upon his people, which should be shortened, the Savior said, quote, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Close quote. Matthew 24, verses 29 and 30. Mark, it does not say of the last sign mentioned that it is a sign of his coming, but a sign that the Son of Man is there is seen coming. The events given in this text as signs on which to base faith in his near coming are the signs in the sun, moon, and stars. The other events which follow take place in connection with his actual coming in the clouds of heaven. So immediately after the third of these signs, the one in the stars, comes the Lord's time to raise up his teachers to teach that Christ's coming is at the doors. Now, as to the time of the appearance of these signs, it was to be immediately after the tribulation that the sun was to be darkened, Matthew 24, verse 29. As Mark records, it was to be in those days after the tribulation, Mark 13, verse 24. Our Savior had said that the days should be shortened. By the decree of Maria Teresa and the Acts of Toleration from 1773 to 1776, the rage of persecution against the church was shortened. Although the persecuting power retained control of the civil arm until 1798, its persecutions were closed about 1773. Comparing the statements of the Savior would place the first of these signs between 1773 and 1798. The Dark Day and Night On the 19th of May, 1780, the sun was supernaturally darkened. It was no eclipse, as the moon had fulled the day before. Notwithstanding this, there was a darkness over all the northeastern portion of the United States from 11 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. 
On that occasion, not only was the sun darkened, but the moon refused to reflect the light of the sun. It was a darkness that prevented the sun from shining on the disk of the moon. And as expressed by Noah Webster many years after, quote, no satisfactory reason has ever been assigned for this darkness, close quote. Of this dark day, Herschel, the astronomer, said, quote, The dark day in North America was one of those wonderful phenomena of nature which will always be read of with interest, but which philosophy is at a loss to explain, close quote. Those describing the darkness of the night of May 19, 1780 said, notwithstanding there was a full moon, that, quote, if every luminous body in the universe had been struck out of existence, the darkness could have not been more complete, close quote. The falling stars. The third of these signs, the falling of these stars, was fulfilled on the 13th of November, 1833. On that night, or rather from five hours previous to the day dawn, there was a meteoric shower compared by some to streams of fire coming down from heaven, by others to sparks of fire flying off of some great piece of fireworks. This phenomenon covered all North America, from the Gulf of Mexico on the south to Hudson's Bay on the north, and from the Sandwich Islands on the west to within a few hundred miles of Liverpool on the east. Wherever observed, it was the same continuous shower of stars falling as thick as snowflakes in a snowstorm. Concerning this star shower in 1833, we further quote from the Connecticut Observer of November 25, 1833, quote, The editor of The Old Countryman makes a very serious matter of the falling stars. He says, We pronounce the rain of fire, which we saw on Wednesday morning last, an awful type, a sure forerunner, a merciful sign of that great and dreadful day which the inhabitants of the earth will witness when the sixth seal shall be opened. The time is just at hand, described not only in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, and a more correct picture of a fig tree casting its fruit when blown by a mighty wind. It was not possible to behold. Close quote. Thomas Burnett's prediction. The people had been taught by those of former times to look for a literal fulfillment of this sign. Thomas Burnett, in his Theory of the Earth, printed in London, A.D. 1697, said of Matthew 24, verse 29, quote, No doubt there will be all sorts of fiery meteors at that time, and amongst others those called falling stars, which, though they are not considerable singly, Yet if they were multiplied in great numbers, falling, as the prophet says, as leaves from the vine or figs from the fig tree, they would make an astonishing sight. We need not look upon these things as hyperbolical and poetic strains, but as barefaced prophecies and things that will literally come to pass. Close quote. Olmsted's testimony professor. Professor Olmsted of Yale College, Massachusetts, who has been called America's greatest meteorologist, said of the falling stars of November 13, 1833, quote, The extent of the shower of 1833 was such as to cover no inconsiderable part of the Earth's surface, from the middle of the Atlantic on the east to the Pacific on the west, and from the northern coast of South America to undefined regions among the British possessions on the north. The exhibition of shooting stars was not only visible, but everywhere presented the same appearance. Close quote. Of this display, which began about 11 p.m. November 12th and continued until about 4 a.m. of the 13th, 
the professor says, quote, Those who were so fortunate as to witness the exhibition of shooting stars on the morning of November 13, 1833, probably saw the greatest display of celestial fireworks that has ever been seen since the creation of the world, or at least within the annals covered by the pages of history. Close quote. Star shower seen also in Europe. In a book published by Leonard Heinrich Kelber in Stuttgart, Germany, in the year 1835, we learn that this sign was repeated on that side of the Atlantic in the same month, but a few days later, he says, quote, On November 25, 1833, there was a fine display of falling stars on the continent of Europe, and in Minsterberg, Silesia, stars fell like a rain of fire. With them fell balls of fire, making the night so light that the people thought that the houses near them must be on fire. At the same time, in Brin, Austria, there was a falling of stars that covered a space of over 500 square miles. It was described by some as like streams of fire coming down from heaven. Some called it a rain of fire. Horses were frightened by it and fell to the ground. Many people were made sick through fear. Close quote. Application of the parable. Coming down in this line of prophecy past the fulfillment of the third sign, the falling of the stars, our Savior says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. This language does not apply to the generation that was living when our Lord gave this discourse, but to the generation that was to see these things fulfilled. Not fulfilling, but fulfilled. The things to be fulfilled as tokens that Christ is at the door do not include the shaking of the heavens when he will be seen actually coming. These signs of his near coming include this third sign, the one in the stars. The Lord's appointed time for the people to learn a parable of the fig tree dates this side of 1833. Here is the Lord's time for the world to be aroused to the great truth that His coming is at the doors and that His coming will be before the generation who hear that parable shall pass away. So we see how the time is marked out in this prophecy when the great Advent proclamation shall be given to the world, a worldwide proclamation. In fulfillment of this prediction, we find that right then and there in 1833, the Lord was raising up his messengers or ministers in various parts of the world who from 1833 to 1834 sounded the cry of Christ's coming near, even at the doors. And these taught the parable of the fig tree, pointing to these signs of his coming, even as he had instructed them to do. This message, either by the living teacher or through the agency of the printed page, went to every missionary station in the world and to every seaport on the earth. The extent of the message has been plainly set forth by the editor of The Voice of Truth of Rochester, New York, in an issue of January 1845. Quote, the everlasting gospel, as described in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, has been preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Close quote. No case can be more clearly substantiated with facts than that this message has been borne to every nation and tongue under heaven within a very few years past in the preaching of the coming of Christ in 1843, 
1843, Jewish time, our time, 1844, or near at hand. Through the medium of lectures and publications, the sound has gone into all the earth and the words to the end of the world. Close quote from the issue of The Voice of Truth, January of 1845. Now, some people, unacquainted with the facts, have looked upon the Second Advent movement as limited to a certain locality supposing it a work connected with William Miller and a few hundred ministers associated with him in the northern portion of the United States. To such, it may be a surprise to learn that the movement in America, in which elders Miller and Himes were prominent leaders, was but a small part of a great movement that, as stated above, went to the ends of the earth how the movement started in various nations. The Lord's time came for this proclamation to go forth to the world, and in a score or more of different parts of the earth, at about the same time, men were raised up who, without a knowledge of one another's work, went forth to sound this message to all parts of the earth. Those mentioned in chapter 4 who received the light respecting the close of the 2300 days, with one exception, A. Campbell, were moved upon to engage in the proclamation of the first angel's message of Revelation 14. This also by direct agency of the Spirit of God and not by communicating the light to one another. Compared with the Reformation. If we apply the same rule to this movement that Daubigny applied to the rise of the Great Reformation of the 16th century, it must surely be counted as the Lord's message and in the Lord's time. Of that Reformation as a whole, the historian said, quote, Germany did not communicate the truth to Switzerland, nor Switzerland to France, nor France to England. All these countries received it from God, just as one part of the world does not transmit the light to another part, but the same shining globe communicates it directly to all the earth. Christ, the day spring from on high, infinitely exalted above all mankind, was at the period of the Reformation as at the establishment of Christianity the divine fire which gave life to the world. In the 16th century, one and the same doctrine was at once established in the homes and churches of the most distant and diversified nations. The reason is that the same spirit was everywhere at work producing the same faith. The Reformation of Germany and that of Switzerland demonstrate this truth. Zwingli had no intercourse with Luther. There was no doubt a link between these two men, but we must search for it above the earth. He who from heaven gave the truth to Luther gave it to Zwingli. God was the medium of communication between them. I began to preach the gospel, says Swingley, in the year of grace, 1516. In other words, at a time when the name of Luther had never been heard of in our country. I did not learn the doctrine of Christ from Luther, but from the word of God. If Luther preaches Christ, he does what I do. That is all. This is quoted from History of the Reformation, Book 8. Chapter 1, Paragraphs 2 and 3. Speaking of the work of Farrell and Lavrie in France, the historian says, quote, The Reformation in France, therefore, was not a foreign importation. It had its birth on the French soil. It germinated in Paris. It had its first roots in the university itself, which formed the second power in Roman Christendom. God placed the principles of the work in the honest hearts of men of Picardy and Dauphiné before its commencement in any other country. We have seen that the Swiss Reformation was independent of the German Reformation. 
the French Reformation was in its turn independent of both. The work began at once in these different countries without any communication with each other as in a battle all the different forces comprising the army move at the same instant though the one does not tell the other to march because one and the same command proceeding from the same commander-in-chief is heard by all. The time was accomplished, the people were prepared, and God began the reformation of his church in all countries at once. Such facts demonstrate that the great reformation of the 16th century was a divine work. Close quote. History of the Reformation, Book 12, Chapter 3, Paragraph 10. Of the Reformation in England under Thomas Bilne, Freith, Tyndale, and others, Daubigny further says, quote, The Reformation of England commenced, therefore, independently of Luther and Zwingli, holding solely from God. There was in all these countries of Christendom a simultaneous action of the divine word. The origin of the Reformation at Oxford, Cambridge, London, was the Greek New Testament published by Erasmus. Tyndale and Thomas Bilney quitted Cambridge in the year 1519. There came a day when England was proud of this high origin of the Reformation. Close quote, quoted from History of the Reformation, Book 18, Chapter 2, Paragraph 12. The Advent Proclamation arose in a similar manner to that above traced in the Reformation. Men were moved out simultaneously in more than four times as many parts of the world with no knowledge of or any communication of sentiment with one another and began the proclamation of the same scripture truths not simply in four nations of the earth but to the whole civilized world joseph wolf's labors it may be well at this point to call attention to facts respecting the extent of the advent proclamation quote in 1831, Joseph Wolfe, D.D., was sent as a missionary from Great Britain to labor among the Jews of Palestine. He, according to his journals, down to the year 1845, proclaimed the Lord's speedy advent in Palestine, Egypt, on the shores of the Red Sea, Mesopotamia, the Crimea, Persia, Georgia, throughout the Ottoman Empire, in Greece, Arabia, Turkey, Bukhara, Afghanistan, Kashmir, Hindustan, Tibet, in Holland, Scotland, Ireland, Constantinople, Jerusalem, St. Helena, also on shipboard in the Mediterranean, and in New York City to all denominations. He declares that he has preached among Jews, Turks, Mohammedans, Parsis, Hindus, Chaldeans, Yesidis, Syrians, Sabians, Tupashas, Sheikhs, Shahs, the kings of Arnst and Bokhara, the queen of Greece, etc. Quoted from The Voice of the Church, page 343. In Yemen, the region inhabited by the descendants of Hobab, Moses' father-in-law, Joseph Wolfe saw a book which he thus speaks, quote, The Arabs of this place have a book called Sirah, which treats the second coming of Christ and his reign and glory. This is quoted from Wolfe's mission to Bukhara. In Yemen, he spent six days with the Rechabites, of whom he says, quote, They drink no wine, plant no vineyards, sow no seed, live in tents, and remember the words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab. With them were children of Israel, of the tribe of Dan, 
who reside near Tirim in Hatramat, who expect in common with the children of Rechab the speedy arrival of the Messiah in the clouds of heaven. Close quote. We see from the above that in those fourteen years Wolf himself had proclaimed the news of Christ's coming at the doors in more than twenty different nations. During the same time, the doctrine was extensively agitated in Germany, particularly in the south among the Moravians. The message in Germany and Russia. An English writer, Morant Brock, informs us that in Württemberg there was a Christian colony numbering hundreds who looked for the speedy advent of Christ. The doctrine was proclaimed in other parts of Germany by Hinsdenberg, at that time said to be the most talented theologian in Germany. In the Review and Herald of December 13, 1892, Pastor L. R. Conradi of Germany says, quote, Bengal in Germany kindled the love for the appearing of our Lord in many a heart, which led thousands to study the prophetic word as never before. The light shone in Germany, and publications showing the application of the 2300 days were circulated there. A religious awakening followed, especially in Württemberg. And as persecution arose, hundreds of families went to southern Russia and there spread it among their own countrymen who had moved there many years before. As the pastors closed their churches, with very few exceptions, they would hold their student or hour of meetings in private houses and hundreds were converted. Even at that time, the Sabbath was discussed among them, but no one making a start, it was smothered. A Russian farmer was converted in the Stunden and then began the same work among the Russians. This finally led to the great Stundist movement of the present day, whose influence extends to the most distant corner of Siberia and the Transcaucasus. Close quote. In the Review and Herald of July 31, 1891, is a statement from Pastor Conradi respecting Brother Chache of Australia, who at the time of which he speaks was a resident of Cilicia and labored a part of the time in the interest of the home mission of Father Gosner, a noted German evangelist divine. From Brother Chache, he gives the following respecting Kelber's book, quote, After 1836, or when Bengel's computation had expired, there appeared in the Schwindnitz County paper a notice from the bookstore of Mr. Sommerfeld there concerning a book from L. Henry Kilber concerning the great and glad events which were to take place in the years 1843 and 1844. The exact title of the book I do not remember. We procured the said book and read it with a number of interested persons with locked doors in the year 1839 to 1840. The book showed from Daniel and the Revelation in Matthew 24 that the end was at hand, and it also a table of computation showing how the above was reached. Close quote. The Message in Great Britain in an English publication entitled The Millennium, it is stated that 700 ministers of the Church of England were raising the cry of the return of the Redeemer. Among some of the most talented ministers of the time were those who proclaimed the Advent doctrine in England from 1840 to 1844. Of these, we will mention the names of Bickerstiff, Burks, Brooks, Brock, Habershon, Pline, Fermantel, Nathan Lord, McNeil, Winters, Cummings, J. H. McCall, D. D., Dr. Nesbitt, Reverend A. Dallas, M. A., in his book, Look to Jerusalem, page 114, he applies the parable of Matthew 24 to this generation. Burgess, Roughton, Gunner, Barker, Bonham, Daltrey, etc. 
the message in Holland. The doctrine of the second advent was proclaimed in Holland by Henzing Peter, said to have been at that time the ablest minister in that country. He was the keeper of the Royal Museum at The Hague, under the appointment of the king. He says of himself, in a letter written to the editor of the Midnight Cry in June of 1844, that his attention was first called to the subject by a very impressive dream. He investigated the scriptures on the subject, and in the year 1830 published a pamphlet setting forth the doctrine. In 1841 he published another pamphlet on the end of the world. In the same letter, he says, the first information he received in regard to William Miller and the others who were proclaiming publicly the doctrine of the near approach of Christ was in 1842 by conversing with a man who had come to Holland from America. The Message in Tartary As early as 1821, the doctrine of the Lord's coming was believed and taught in Tartary. About this time, an Irish missionary was sent to that country, and a Tartar priest put the question to him, When will Christ come the second time? He made answer that he knew nothing at all about it, whereupon the priest expressed great surprise at such an answer from a missionary who had come to teach them the doctrines of the Bible, and remarked that he thought everybody might know that who had a Bible. The priest then gave his views, stating that he thought Christ would come about A.D. 1844. This fact is found in the Irish Magazine, 1821. The Message in America, India, and on the Continent In Advent Tracts, Volume 2, page 135, 1844, Marant Brock of England says, quote, It is not merely in Great Britain that the expectation of the near return of the Redeemer is entertained and the voice of warning raised, but also in America, India, and on the continent of Europe. In America, about 300 ministers of the word are thus preaching this gospel of the kingdom, whilst in this country, about 700 of the Church of England are raising the same cry. Close quote to every seaport on earth. E. R. Pinney of Seneca Falls, New York, a devoted Baptist minister who gave his life to the proclamation of the Advent doctrine in his exposition of Matthew 24, pages 8 and 9, said, quote, As early as 1842, Second Advent publications had been sent to every missionary station in Europe, Asia, Africa, and America, both sides of the Rocky Mountains, the commanders of our vessels and the sailors tell us that they touch at no port where they find this proclamation has not preceded them, and frequent inquiries respecting it are made of them. Close quote. 3,000 proclaiming the message. Pastor G. W. Mitchell of Zanesville, Ohio, another minister who himself proclaimed the doctrine, said to the writer in a conversation at Newark, Ohio, on August 8, 1894, that Elder William Miller told him in a conversation at McConnellsville, Ohio, in September of 1844, that he had the names and addresses of 3,000 ministers in various parts of the globe who were proclaiming, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. The greater portion of these being in North America and Great Britain. William Miller, in speaking of the extensive spread of this cry, said, quote, one or two in every quarter of the globe have proclaimed the news, and all agree in the time. Wolf of Asia, Irving Late of England, Mason of Scotland, Davis of South Carolina, and quite a number in this region are, or have been, giving the cry. Quoted from William Miller's Lectures, pages 238 in 1843. Hutchinson's voice of Elijah sent broadcast. 
Elder R. Hutchinson, in 1837, was sent from England as a Wesleyan missionary to Canada. He finally settled in Montreal. He had very extensive acquaintance in foreign countries. In the years 1843 and 1844, he published a paper called The Voice of Elijah, in which he treated of the Advent Doctrine. Having ready access to vessels for foreign countries and being privileged to send large parcels of his papers with no expense for postage, he sent them in great quantities to all parts of the earth. He said of his own work that he sent them freely to Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, France, Germany, Constantinople, Rome, in all parts of the British kingdom and its colonies, in the Sandwich Islands. In the midnight cry of October 12, 1843, was a letter from a Mrs. O.S. Burnham of Kaloa, Isle of Kauai, Sandwich Islands. She, with her husband, were school teachers at that place. They accepted and were proclaiming the Advent doctrine there, and a company of believers was worshiping with them on the islands. The message compared with that of John the Baptist. Thus we see that the Advent doctrine was proclaimed to an extent quite sufficient to fulfill the scripture predictions concerning it. The message, which was to herald the first advent of Christ, was stated by the prophet Isaiah in these words, quote, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Close quote, Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5. This prophecy was accomplished in the labors of John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 3, verses 1 and 2. This man alone, during six months of labor in the one country of Judea, fulfilled this wonderful prediction. While this prophecy limited John's work as to time and place, it is not so with those prophecies which relate to the heralding of the second advent, for the work was to be with a loud cry worldwide in its extent. Thus it is seen, in the light of the facts presented, how accurately the prophecy concerning the Advent message was fulfilled. God's time came for the parable of the fig tree to be taught, for the first announcement of the first angel's message to be given, and he raised up his messengers to herald the cry to all nations, peoples, and tongues. This is the end of chapter 5.